So we're going to look um, at this parable we read from verse 27, and we're going to concentrate especially on that phrase at the beginning of verse 28. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. <clears throat> An enemy hath done this. Now this uh, chapter in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, is rather famous for its series of parables. And the most famous of those parables is quite likely the one at the beginning of the, of the chapter that well, we didn't read of this, chapter, verses 22 to 23, the sower and the seed. Now, when Jesus was asked in verse 10, why speakest thou unto them in parables? He gave this somewhat puzzling answer in verse 11. It is given unto you to know the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And then he adds this intriguing statement in verse 13, because they seeing see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Now, whatever else lay behind the purpose of teaching in parables, it is evident that many people in the world have no wish whatsoever to hear, to see, to understand anything that God is doing in this world. The ministry of Jesus, I think, bears witness to that reality. There were multitudes of people who uh, listened to every word he spoke and rejoiced in the miracles that he performed, but multitudes more didn't. And even the ones that did, you could ask, well, where were they at Calvary? There wasn't a sign of any of them. They were fair weather friends. And the more he seemed to preach and the more he seemed to perform miracles, the more it seemed to stir up the anger and hatred and rejection of many, all of which, of course, came to a head at Calvary. Now, whether we understand these parables or not, we have to admit, don't we, that they do make us think. To say the least, they make us think. Perhaps it's even true that they challenge us in areas of our lives where we don't want to be challenged. But whatever the case, most commentators agree that each parable has a primary meaning, although other interpretations can be drawn from the parable as well. And many of them make us ask, at least I continually ask this question when I read the parables of our Lord, what exactly did he have in mind with this particular parable or with this phrase in this parable? I'm always asking that question. And sometimes, in, like in this parable, we're actually given an explanation of the parable in verses 37 to 43. Well, we're going to look, first of all, at the imagery of this parable. And then we're going to look at this phrase in a bit of detail. An enemy has done this. So let's look at the imagery. Verse 24. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Now, this would have been an everyday occurrence almost in Israel because they were very much an agricultural society. So uh, seeing people sowing seed would be nothing new to them. They were very dependent on the produce of the land. Now, this classic parable, in my view, the sower and the seed, is uh, based on that uh, reality. And Jesus was a genius. He was a genius in any case, but he was particularly a genius in choosing the right image, the right illustration, the right metaphor to display his message to men and to women, to boys and to girls. And um, whenever I read uh, of Charles Spurgeon's sermons, which I don't do often enough, I'm convinced that he copied very much the style of a Lord in the amazing ways that a Baptist preacher used 
his own illustrations. So those listening to Jesus here would have immediately related to this imagery. It was so familiar to them. But I think some of them would have struggled with this phrase, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. To this day, there is controversy over what exactly did Jesus mean by that phrase, the kingdom of heaven. And even more importantly, from our point of view, how should that phrase be applied in the preaching of the gospel? I think it's easy to see that the kingdom of heaven on one hand and one level is that holy environment where God and the angels and the saints made perfect in holiness where they reside in glory. We understand that plain enough. But obviously, that's not what Jesus has in mind here. And nor is it the true Christian church known only to God. These born-again Christians in all the nations of the earth, that's not what he has in mind either. So the context uh, shows us that it has to be the body of people on earth gathered for worship, consisting in biblical times at least of mostly Jews. But even they were a mixed bunch as they listened to the preaching of the kingdom. Paul tells us that not all Israel are of Israel. And then when we come into the New Testament era, we have to broaden the picture to include Gentile, the Gentile world. So this is a picture, in my view, of the broadest of the Christian church. The Christian church can be seen in various, we talk about the visible and the invisible church of Christ. This is the visible church in its broadest sense, including some what we can only call loony denominations that bear very little resemblance to the teaching of the Bible. And I want you to notice something about this. The gospel is obviously good seed. And the men employed for sowing the seed, or should I say, those who are employed for sowing, the real sower isn't men. The real sower is working in the background of men it's the Lord Jesus himself. Verse 37. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. And to all intents and purposes, that good seed should bring forth a good harvest. And not only that, it's impossible to get better or healthier seed than the seed provided by Jesus Christ. However, the previous parable, the parable of the sower, demonstrates to us the seed may be perfect, but the ground is not. That's one of the important points he made in the parable of the sower. And yet the soil wasn't our Lord's concern here, but the tears that were mixed in with the seed. Um, when I was preparing this, I was thinking, well, the seed available to farmers today is seed that is tried and tested in dozens of ways so that they're quite likely get a, almost a pure seed to plant in the ground. 2,000 years ago, it wasn't like that. The, the, uh, in fact, the, the tears on the seed looked quite similar. You couldn't tell them apart until they were put into the ground. And it is only as the stalk began to grow that you could see this is not healthy. There are tears in amongst this seed. Now, I think that's a perfect illustration of the Christian church throughout this world. There is much good seed sown in the Christian church. But there is also many tears sown in that same church. 
And we can see it when it comes to light. We can see it in the experience of those who claim to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, or at least in some of them. Now, here's a challenge for those of us who are in positions of um, responsibility in the church, elders and ministers like myself. When men and women, and boys and girls too sometimes, when they come to a session claiming to have received the gospel seed in their hearts, believing sincerely that they have the root of the matter in their heart. No minister, no elder on the face of the earth can prove otherwise. Not if it's based only on a mere profession of faith. Who am I to say to a man or to a woman, young or old, if they claim, I, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior? Who am I to say, oh, well, I don't think so. That's why in our Reformed practice, sessions look for three things when it comes to membership in the church or applying for membership. We look, first of all, for a profession of personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first thing and the most important thing. Secondly, we look for some evidence of repentance in that person's life. There has to be some evidence of repentance. I'm not saying that they need to go around wearing a hairy shirt and crying, woe is me, I'm a sinner. No, but there has to be some evidence of repentance. And the third thing a session should be looking for is a walk in life consistent with faith in the Lord Jesus. Now, I think it has to be said that most professions of faith made in the free church continuing, as far as I am aware, is the real thing. We very seldom hear in our denomination of people going back into the world. Very, very seldom do we hear that. But we also have to face the reality of what Jesus taught here. Then appeared the tears also. And in the wider Christian church throughout the world, tears in the membership are more evident than ever before. But our sessions have to be careful. As Jesus replied to the disciples here when they suggested that they would go out and uh, collect all those tears growing amongst the good seed, verse 29, no, he said, no. Lest while you gather up the tears, you root up the wheat with them. So sessions have to act with great care when it comes to matters of this nature. Let me move on then to look at um, the social implication of this phrase, an enemy has done this, and then we will look at the spiritual implications of it. We are left in no doubt who this enemy is. Remember what God said to Cain at the dawn of history in Genesis chapter 4. He said to him, sin lieth at the door. That is the door of your heart. And unto thee shall be his desire. It's a picture of a crouched, dangerous animal. And I think it's easy for us to appreciate that this is exactly what Peter based his warning on when he wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5, Be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And it's that dangerous animal that Jesus has in mind here, an enemy has done this. Now this enemy continues in every age, and perhaps today more than ever, continues to wreak havoc in the Christian church, 
in families associated with the Christian church and in societies sympathetic to the philosophy of the Christian church. Breaks havoc. And although the Christian church is always the main concern in God's care, nevertheless, the interpretation Jesus put on this parable allows for a much wider application. So notice the first part of his explanation in verse 38. The field, now this is where the seed is sown. The field, wouldn't you expect him to say, is the broad church? But that's not what he says. The field is the world. The field is the world. This is the world wherever the gospel is preached and wherever the seed is sown. It doesn't have to be in a church. It doesn't have to be amongst the people of God. It could be your witness to a total stranger. The field is the world. So let's consider that for a moment in the light of how it affects us in the Western world these days. Now, historically, as I often remind you in preaching, all Western societies were built on Christian principles. So you can go from Sydney to Stornoway, and our educational systems, our judicial systems, and our social ethics were all based, loosely or otherwise, on the teaching of this book, the Holy Bible. And that only changed in recent times. In recent times. Here's the answer to what brought that change. An enemy has done this. And we know that, <coughs> excuse me, because our political philosophy as a nation hasn't really changed. We haven't become communists. We're not ruled by dictators and despots, at least not yet. We still claim to be democracies. Our citizens still claim to have the same values. Yet we have changed. And we have changed dramatically. Our political elites advocate and support the most immoral practices this world has ever seen. The people who are ruling over you today in Westminster and in Hollywood. And it all happened here in the United Kingdom, in America, in Australia, in New Zealand, and throughout most of Europe. It all happened so fast, so smoothly, we can only repeat the words of Jesus. An enemy has done this. Working through gullible men and women, that enemy is presently tearing asunder the very fabric of Western society. He has even managed to silence the mouth of the Christian church. None of the religious leaders in the mainstream churches up and down a land, none of them ever protest and say to the government, enough. No further must you go with this. I noticed that Welby made a pathetic little plea a couple of days ago. It means nothing. But I'm not pointing a finger at Welby or at any other uh, political leader or religious leader. All of us, my friends, members and adherents of the church, we are potentially guilty in this matter. If we haven't, at the very least, put pen to paper and written to our councillors or to a local MP to protest the government stance on any number of things. This enemy has succeeded in silencing us. And when good people do nothing, the wicked prosper. And furthermore, my friends, we should be looking beyond today. We should be asking ourselves, what kind of a church, 
What kind of a community, what kind of a society are we going to leave our children and the generation yet unborn? Let me move thirdly to the spiritual implications of this phrase, an enemy has done. Nobody is safe from this enemy. And nobody knew that better than the man who warned us about the roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. Peter became a particular target for this enemy, as Jesus warned him in Luke 22. Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now, every believer um, is protected as Peter was by the intercession of Jesus Christ. But I have prayed for you. That's a precious, precious statement on the part of our Lord. However, this enemy is persistent, he's subtle, and he is sneaky. And despite Peter being constantly in the presence and in the vicinity of the Lord, this enemy still got him. This enemy still got him and persuaded him to deny the Lord Jesus. Nobody is safe. Not even the high falluting figures throughout the Christian church in modern times. Only this past month, news came to us from America the world-famous preacher and theologian, a man that I greatly admired, a man that I listened to many times with appreciation, Stephen Lawson, was exposed as an adulterer and had been living as an adulterer for the past five years. I was absolutely shocked. Not long before that, a few years ago, Another famous servant of God, another man I listened to with appreciation and I admired him greatly, Rabbi Zacharias, was exposed to pretty much the same thing. These men were giants, giants in the Reformed faith, yet this enemy got them. Now, Lawson, of course, and Zacharias couldn't blame Satan. They were accountable for their own conduct. But nevertheless, this enemy was lurking in their orbit, seeking his moment to devour their reputations and destroy their ministries. And he did exactly that. An enemy has done this. And we can look back, my friends, on generations of Christian church history, and we see the wreckage of so many stalwart servants of God, and we have to conclude an enemy has done this. And any of the Lord's people would be foolish to think, it can't happen to me. The moment a believer begins thinking that he or she is rock solid in their walk and talk before God, that's when this ever watchful enemy will come in, either like a little fox or like a roaring lion. Take heed, Jesus said, lest uh, you fall. And furthermore, this vulnerability of individual believers also applies to churches, to denominations, to congregations. One of the tragic pictures of our day is seeing the many once vibrant churches up and down our land now with our doors closed. Now, of course, there could be many factors in that equation, but one thing is certain. Somewhere in that mix, we can say an enemy has done this. Jesus once said, watch and pray. You know, that has always fascinated me. Because the implication is, it's not enough to pray. That even sounds absurd to my own ears, that it's not enough to pray. But here Jesus say, watch and pray. 
we must also man the watchtower of our hearts. Why? To be alert to this enemy. In ancient times, the alertness and security of the Lord's people depended on being vigilant night and day, even in the darkness of the night. And that's depicted for us in a phrase in Isaiah 21, where there were um, guards um, used throughout the night and a call would go out to the guard from time to time through the night watches. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? A denomination, a congregation, a church member. My friends, we're only as safe as the alertness of each individual to this prowling enemy. Hence the repeated exhortation of Scripture recorded by Paul concerning the most daring of the churches. He ministered to us. We looked a little at this in the morning. Let a man examine himself. Aren't we guilty of applying that only to the first time someone comes to the session? Let a man examine himself. And so let it be. Self-examination, my friends, is a non-going exercise, a lifelong exercise in the experience of the believer. If you want to ensure your spiritual health, you'd better continue examining yourself. So Paul had to follow it up by saying, examine yourselves. This is a... Um, when he wrote the second letter to the Corinthians, having asked the first time to examine themselves, it could do with the Lord's Supper. In the second letter to the Corinthians, in chapter 13, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves that Jesus Christ is in you. That puts the onus entirely upon you and upon me as individual believers. lest you think that's too challenging. You are also expected to subject yourself to what somebody once called the deep spiritual x-ray of Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. That takes courage, my friends. That takes courage, as well as faith and grace. But if we have a genuine desire to be right with God, to be in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what we must do. If we are to avoid being victims of the enemy of our soul, we have to be alert. We have to examine ourselves. Now, for this congregation, as we contemplate sitting at the Lord's table next Sabbath, this enemy is going to be busy. He's going to be busy with each one of us. And he's going to be busy in providing us with countless suggestions and excuses why we shouldn't sit at the Lord's table. Mark my words, in the next few days, he will highlight your every shortcoming. He will show you your faults and your failings. And he will mock you for your sins and for your little faith. Be on the lookout for him. But let me provide the answer, the only answer you must give to his every attack and every temptation and every subtle way he tries to bring you down. There's only one answer. 
the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Don't try and argue with them. For one reason, he may be right. He may be right that you are full of shortcomings, faults, unfailings. He may be right. Nevertheless, you have this protection. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And he will cleanse us to the extent that we will be purer than the driven snow in the eyes of God himself. And that's what really matters. Not what the Satan says, not what others think about us, so long as we are right with God. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, we thank thee for thy word and for its teaching. We thank thee that we are alert to the enemy of our souls and grant that we would not fall victim to him and that you would not make us stumble as we contemplate the Lord's Supper the next uh, Sabbath day. Undertake for us, be a wall of fire around us. Fill us with yearning and desire for fellowship with our Saviour, that word and sacrament would feed our very souls. And may it all be to the glory of thy blessed name, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.